Yes. However, if I need to move you, I will. Oh, guys, baby pig being born, baby pig being born. Right there, right there it is. Hey, baby pig! Oh my God. It's a baby girl. It's a baby girl. Look, there's a baby pig, guys. Okay, no, 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 no. You need to be sitting somewhere where you can write, not on the table. You guys need a sheet of paper so you can take notes. If you missed it, this little piglet that they're putting over by its mom was just born. You may have missed it. Yeah, there it is. There it is. And I will let them do introductions. I expect you guys to take some notes as you go along. All right, and capture what you learn. It's all yours, you guys. Okay, Jennifer, do you want me to start? We're, we are here in the office and just give us one moment. All right, I can see the class. I cannot yet. I need to figure that out. I can I can see you guys. <laughs> Great. Well, welcome. Emily, do you want to make sure and re are we re recording? All right. So thank you guys all all very much for joining us on a virtual field trip to pig farms today. Um, I am Jennifer Osterholt. You can see my name there on the screen. I'm actually behind the camera right now. I bet I'll come out at some point. But um, we are here with Tom Graham and Dr. Terry Speck. And um, Tom, his family has Oakland Farms, as you can see there in the background. Emily Beer is in the Ohio Port Council office in Columbus. And, and we are in, so Oakland Farms, we are in East Central Ohio. We have a finishing barn here. And Jeff Webker is at a sow farm, so a mother barn in Versailles in Western Ohio. And we are so excited to get to visit with you guys today. So um, the, there's some groups making this all possible that we need to give credit to, and that's the Ohio Soybean Council. Farm Credit Mid-America, and Cargill. So we appreciate the support to, to have the technology and, and to be able to, to do this live video. So um, I visited with your teacher ahead of time, and she said that you guys are interested in finding out what happens day to day on the farm, what farmers do, and um, then we'll, we'll get into some other topics of interest, and we want to take questions. So when we get out into the barn, it can be a little bit noisy and difficult to hear. Don't hesitate to, to send me a message, or you might have to say something a couple times um, and before we realize that there is a question. So just give us some patience there. But without further ado, let's go ahead and um, go to Jeff Webker. Jeff, do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself and your family and your farm? And and what you do, you want to talk for about five five to ten minutes, and then we're going to come back to Terry. Sure. Well, first of all, welcome to uh, to uh, our farm. Uh, I'm I'm uh, and, and again, what's the name of? Is it? It's not just Dublin. It's uh, is it? Is it? Or is it? I know there's a couple of different schools. Is is am I correct in uh, Dublin, or is it? Are you called Dublin High School? I don't know if I heard. Yeah, I, did. Yeah, I, I might have missed part of that. Sorry about that. Well, welcome. Welcome to our farm. I'm uh, just about um, about 90 miles straight west of Dublin here in Versailles, Ohio. Uh, we freak come through that way quite often. Um, uh, we are a, 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 a farm that raises baby pigs. So we have about a thousand baby pigs born a week here at the farm. Um, we've been doing this, 
it seems like pretty much my entire life, but we did it on a much smaller scale um, years ago or, or when I was in elementary and high school. Um, I guess in, uh, in when I was in high school, your age, we had 100 sows. Um, so a sow is the, is the mother pig, um, and we had about 100 of them. Today on this farm, we have 2,000 of them. And we also have a second farm um, that we own in Indiana, and there's 2,700 sows there. So between the two farms, we produce a, a little over 120,000 baby pigs a year uh, that go to other farms like Tom that you're going to uh, learn more about here in a little bit to be raised up uh, to, uh, to uh, a larger size to market, market size. So um, a little bit about our family. Um, I'm in a partnership with my brother and uh, he has four children that, uh, that are raised here on the farm. And I have two children. I have a junior in high school and an eighth grader. Um, so we were just talking a little bit before you come on about, I was helping my daughter last night with a math problem uh, that, I wanted to solve one way and she wanted to solve another way. So I'm sure some of you get into that too uh, occasionally with your, your parents. So um, we, uh, we also raise uh, not only just pigs, but we raise the corn that we feed our pigs. Uh, so we have about a thousand acres. So this time of year is really busy. We're also harvesting. Uh, so we just wrapped up our soybean harvest uh, last week and we're about two thirds of the way done with our corn harvest. So um, I know some of you, as you come in, got to see a baby pig being born, got to see this pig being born right there. And I'm going to keep an eye on her. I think she's going to have another one here shortly. So sometimes when we do the virtual field trips, we get to see babies born and sometimes not. So today's a good morning. We've got a lot of what we call active farrowers or sows that are um, in active farrowing. And that's the, the process of giving birth. So um, we're um, um, we're going to talk a little bit later about, um, about some of the aspects of the feed. And I know this is an uh, advanced placement environmental uh, class. So I, I'm really looking for, forward to questions that you might have. We might have another one here real shortly. We'll see. Um, and so uh, I, we do a lot of things uh, that relate directly back to the environment on the farm every day. So. And sometimes we don't even really think about it. We just, it, it's just a part of what, um, of what we, of what we do. So um, anyway, um, with that, um, I'm going to let uh, Jennifer and Tom and Dr. Speck join in and I'll just keep my video up here and they can uh, kind of talk a little bit about what Tom does and then we can uh, go into some further details. Well, hi, everybody. Thanks for joining in with us today. My name is Tom Graham. Uh, I'm actually uh, over in Muskingum County, north of uh, Frazeysburg a little bit. My story is not a lot different than Jeff's. We, we kind of do the same things. I, uh, I farm in a partnership with my brother. My parents are still involved a little bit. They all live here on the farm. Uh, I used to uh, farrow pig. We got out of it probably close to 20 years ago and kind of missed the pig so much. So we put up a barn and now we do wean to finish. So when uh, about three weeks of age, when Jess gets, his pigs are about three weeks of age, they come to a barn like mine. And then I raise them on up to finishing age. Uh, throw a little bit of, of uh, something else in that. My barn is all females and we call those gilts before they, we're gonna go on out. Gilts are female pigs who become sows later, like the one there that's giving birth now. Uh, so that being said, in a gilt wean to finish barn that's producing gilts to go back to other farms, we take a shower before we go into our barn. And that's, that's to protect, protect these pigs from any outside viruses and dirt. And we just try to keep them as healthy as we can. But I... And that's why our hair looks so amazing. <laughs> I can take as many as, every time I come in the barn, I take a shower. So if I come in three times a day, I take six showers, one coming in, one going out. So, but it's all to, uh, it's all to protect the animals. Uh, 
some other things that we do, I, I mentioned we do crops. We do, uh, we had 400 acres of corn this year and 200 acres of soybeans. And like Jeff, we finished our soybeans last week and we're about half done with our corn. But uh, typical life on a pig farm is, it's kind of an unwritten rule that on a farm, livestock comes first. So our duties start out in our barns in the morning. Uh, when pigs are young, like, like the ones you're seeing that Jeff has, and when I get them at about three weeks old, I'm typically spending about six hours a day caring and, and looking after these younger pigs. Now, when they're as big as they are right now, and these are about uh, three to four months old, it doesn't take as much work, but I'm still here every day looking for things, adjusting feeders, making sure, uh, I think, show them the water lines the hoses and stuff where they drink. They drink they drink their water out of those those cups you can see there. And Dr. Terry's gonna go point those out. Pigs are curious and they like to climb and I mean they don't get over the gates but they like to climb up those gates and they can actually yank those hoses down. So we we monitor our water and and just constantly look at things. And a hog burner is always something to fix. They're very curious and they they're always working on something. So, um, Tom, this is this is Jennifer here with the Port Council. I'm in, in Tom's barn. Tell us how adjusting the feeder, how that affects the environment. We keep our feeders adjusted down to a certain level. We're gonna to try to show you a picture of what a what a level an adequate level is. You want enough feed in the feeder to satisfy them, so there's always feed there. But if you can see this one very, very easily, the light's kind of, kind of bad. Uh, they can waste feed, and wasted feed falls through the floor, and through these cracks in the in the floor is where the manure goes too. There's a big pit underneath, and wasted feed is wasted money, and it it just kind of offsets our, our nutrient value of, of our manure. Wasted resource. It's a wasted resource, exactly right. So we, we monitor our feed settings. There's an adjustment on every feeder, and it needs to be looked at every day because things change. Their, their habits change if it's, if it's a different, you know, they're, they're inside an environmentally controlled building, but at the same time, when the weather changes outside, it affects things inside. Just airflow changes, temperature changes a little bit, and, and they know it and react to it. So what's your feed made of? Repeat that question. The feed in this, in this uh, ration here is, uh, is mostly corn. That's the, that's the energy source. There's soybean meal in it, for basically for the protein source. And then there's also nutrients in it, such as uh, uh, phosphorus and and calcium and, and things need, it's a, it's a more of a, it, basically all pigs eat the same diet with some minor adjustments based on what the, what the end product of the animal could be. Like I say, these animals are primarily raised to be used as breeding stock at later dates. Now, those numbers are typically about 85% that, that'll be selected to go back to, a, to another farm to be used as mothers and the ones that, that aren't will go on and be harvested, you know, for meat. Oh, hi. <laughs> but uh, that's kind of what we do and why we do things. Uh, if you can see, can you show them down the end? In this barn, you can see there's, maybe you can't tell from this distance, but there's five fans in the end of this barn. One of those fans is actually running right now. There's computers that uh, measure the air temperature, and Terry's pointing out an inlet in the ceiling. When we have cooler temperatures like we have today, these air inlets, and they're, they're computer controlled, they open and close according to how much, how much uh, airflow we need. So as this room, as the room warms up, more fans come on, and these inlets open further to let more air in. If you're noticing more noise in the barn, pigs are, I mean, these pigs are used to me. I'm in this barn every day, and they're used to me, and they react differently when someone else comes in. 
So if you're hearing the noise level pick up a little bit, that's the reason. They're always, like I said, they're always curious. They, they want to know what's going on. All right. Let's go back to the office maybe and see so are there any questions at this point or shall we go to Dr. Speck? Je Jennifer, if I if I could, could I I'd like to touch a little bit more on the feed since that was just brought up. All right, we will hand the microphone to Dr. Speck and have her share about herself. Good morning everyone. So my name is Dr. Terry Speck, and I've been a veterinarian for about eight years now. I did go to Ohio State University for both my undergrad, grad, and veterinary school. I did grow up on a farm, actually a little bit more east, east of where Tom's at in Tuscarawas County. And with my career, I started out as a mixed animal practitioner, meaning that I took care of both dogs and cats, small animal, companion animal, horses, dairy cattle, beef cattle, sheep and hogs. And then I had an opportunity to move to Western Ohio and focus mainly in swine medicine. And I've been doing that now for five years. I work currently, I did oversee and help Jeff, uh, oversee Jeff and help him out at his hog farm, the sow unit there where the piglets are born. And I also now just work for one specific farm and travel. So what I do is, is I travel all over the state because you can imagine the pigs are located all over. And I have the opportunity to meet many, many farmers across the state, even get into Indiana and sometimes Michigan and Pennsylvania. So it varies. I work with Tom pretty heavily because as he mentioned earlier, these are gilts and we sell them all over the United States and they become mamas, just like what you're seeing at Jeff's farm. They become mamas and have babies of their own. But I have to make sure that there's no bugs or viruses or anything, bacteria, um, that's in these pigs before they're allowed to go. So I write health papers. Uh, every 30 days I need to look at these pigs. And I also take some different tests and make sure that nothing's gotten into this barn that we're not sure of. So the pig's trying to get the hose. So as Tom already mentioned, pigs are very, very curious. Uh, one thing that I look for in these barns is I look for the size of the pigs. You can imagine physical exams. Is there any way I could probably perform physical exams on every single pig? Uh, in a way I do, because I look at every pig kind of from the front, so from their heads, make sure that their eyes, eyes are all clear, uh, that just like people, if you're sick, uh, you don't feel as well. So I always get into the pens and make sure everybody gets up in a timely manner. If I have to go over and and kind of bump a pig, sometimes that means they're slow and they're not feeling good. So then I really, really focus on that pig, make sure when it does get up that it doesn't have a limp. Just like many of you probably have a dog or a cat at home, um, if it seems like it's limping somewhere, then you usually take it to the vet and fi find out what's going on. I do the same thing. The other unique thing in these barns is an automatic feed line. So I communicate with Tom and make sure that the pigs are going through feed uh, at the rate that they should be for their growth. And also feed. If we go back into the office at some point, we have a meter in the office and it tells us the water consumption that these pigs are drinking on a daily basis. Sometimes I can catch uh, if there's a virus, just like flu. Unfortunately, there are some viruses um, that go back and forth, just germs that go back and forth between people and animals, um, just like in even companion animals, dogs and cats. Uh, there's some bacteria and things that go back and forth. So I always keep an eye on the water consumption and make sure that the pigs are drinking what they should. And if it decreases, then we look at is there anything that's going on uh, that might alarm us and really watch that. One thing about pigs is, is you always want to get them started from the get-go. Day one, when those pigs arrive, what you're seeing at Jeff's, it's really critical that those pigs get off to a good start. 
he's getting them dry, he's getting them warm, and he's getting them up to the teeth. Um, the first milk that pigs consume are, is called colostrum, and it contains all the antibiotics or antibodies that really help pigs' immune system get going. Then Tom's job is really critical whenever he gets the pigs because those pigs have just come from their mother and they're used to drinking milk. And their mom actually makes a little bit of a noise every so often and wakes those piglets up so they get up and nurse and they get up and drink their milk. So what Tom does is when he gets the pigs, they're three weeks old. It's really similar to little two-year-olds. So you can imagine, you don't want little two-year-olds running around your barn unsupervised. So Tom comes in about every two to three hours and he puts these mats. These mats are down right here on the flooring. And then there's a heat lamp. It's called a brooder. It's a heat lamp that goes over top of those mats. And those piglets will lay on that mat. They'll get warm. The other thing Tom will take, at that point they're on a little pellet and he'll mat feed, what we call mat feed those pigs every couple hours just to make sure that they're getting their their feed and their water that they need to. A lot of times too, those cup waters I showed you earlier, we will sometimes let those drip just a little bit so the pigs know when they first get to the barn where that water is at. So we start them out from the get-go um, at the best rate that we can. Um, let's flip back into the office and see what, what questions, I'm sorry. Terry's got some, go, keep going. Sorry, Dr. Terry. What, there's, there's one unique test. So I talked about making sure that these pigs are healthy before I ever let them go on to uh, a truck or to a different state. I do do blood testing. So I get a little blood sample just from a, a kind of a proportion of the animals, not every single animal. And then this is called a rope test. And just like if you go to the doctor and your throat sore, you might have strep throat and the doctor may swab the back of your throat. So what we do is, is we tie this rope and you can see how much fun they have with it. It's like a little toy. And we'll let that on there for about 20 to 30 minutes. And they just chewed on it. So their saliva is on that. And then what I would do is, is take, take a Ziploc bag and we just put it over there. I'll have Tom, Tom's helped me out quite a bit with doing these sometimes. And that's the, the nice thing about that is, is because of what's called biosecurity, I may not be able to get to the barn that same day if they, there's a problem, but I can have growers just put the rope, hang a rope and just put it in there we haven't left them chew on it long enough, so we're not gonna get a lot squeezed out. But all we're gonna do is just squeeze that out of there. And it's just some saliva. Like I said, there's not much, but you can see the amount that's in there just for the short period of time already. And then what I do is, is we just pour that into that vial. And this is all that's sent into a lab and they can test and they can test for all sorts of different germs and bugs. And it's really beneficial for the, the swine industry because we do that a lot for um, different bugs and bacteria and viruses. To make sure pigs are healthy. To make sure pigs are healthy and that they're uh, growing the way they should. We're going to move to the office. <laughs> yeah, we we also do similar rope tests on our farm and blood tests as well, just as uh, Dr. Speck had just mentioned, Dr. Terry. Huh. Hey Jeff, did you have more to add about feed too? Yeah, yeah. If I could, I know Tom addressed the feed issue a little bit, and and, and um, we make all of our own feed here at the farm, actually at both farms. And so I'm gonna show you, and, and it's very similar, but I wanna kind of point out some of the environmental aspects as well. So 
I'm going to get a handful of feet here. Bear with me. I've got to be able to do this and hold my iPad at the same time. Just a second here. So there's our feed. Uh, again, mostly corn grown here at the farm. And then soybean meal, which we grow our soybeans here at the, also at the farm. And I often tell people, and can you hear me or is it too loud? I'm going to maybe move. Uh, there's a fan right there behind me. I'll try to make that. That should be better. Okay. Sorry about that. So, so the feed has soybean meal in it, and we grow soybeans here at the farm, and we haul them over to Sydney, Ohio, which is about 30 or 20 minutes east of me, and to a company called Cargill. Cargill takes those soybeans. And they press the oil out of them. And you might, well, what's the oil for? Well, how many of you, I can see the classroom there. How many of you, let's see a raise of hands. How many of you like ranch dressing? Nope. Can you hear me? Are you guys, I put you all to sleep. There you go. There, I see them waking up. Okay. All right. How many of you like ranch dressing? Raise a hand. Raise your hand. Nobody likes ranch dressing? Can they hear me? Yeah, okay. How many of you like, like, um, like dipping sauces at uh, at uh, Burger King or the dip dip stuff in. Do you like like maybe it's uh, honey barbecue? How many of you like that? How many of you like mayonnaise? Some people may not like mayonnaise. I want you to yeah he's smiling up there in the front. Maybe he doesn't like mayonnaise. Okay yeah him in the yellow shirt just looked over at the guy in the green shirt yeah so <laughs> so. We take our soybeans to Cargill. They happen to be a sponsor of this program that you're today. Jennifer mentioned them earlier. They press those soybeans, and the number one ingredient in ranch dressing and in mayonnaise and many are dipping sauces, I want you to go home tonight and look, it's soybean oil. So they make ranch dressing at Cargill in Sydney. They make some of the dipping sauces there. And then there's a byproduct left over, and hey, it's called- Hey, Jeff, you froze up a little bit. Okay. Just all right, is it any better? Emily, give me a thumbs up if I'm not froze up. All right, all right. So the soybean meal, that's the leftovers of the, of the oil that we put, that you're consuming in the ranch dressing and the mayonnaise, that's get the, the major pro. So this feed here, that the, the sows that are milking or lactating, they get about 500 pounds of soybean meal in a ton. When they're gestating, when they're just maintaining themselves, okay, and not lactating, they only get about 185 pounds. So they get more protein, okay, to make lots of milk. So these pigs will go from, the, they're about three pounds here. They'll go from three pounds to 21 pounds or excuse me, to 12 pounds, the third, 12 to 13 pounds in 21 days. I got my numbers mixed up there. So the other thing environmentally, and I know this is an environmental class, the other thing we add that's in our premix, so the premix is calcium and phosphorus. I'm sure you've heard of that before. Uh, calcium's for strong bones and lots of other things. There's also a product called phytase. So write that down on your papers. I want you to Google later, or maybe you got your Chromebooks in front of you. Google phytase, it's P-H-Y-T-A-S-E, phytase. So phyta we add phytase to this feed and that further reduces the amount of phosphorus that we have to put in the feed. So um, we all know that most, all livestock farms have manure. Some people call it a byproduct, I call it a resource. Uh, but we have to manage it responsibly. So one of the things that we're concerned about is we don't want too much phosphorus in our manure. So by adding phytase to this feed, and when you Google it, look it up on Wikipedia, you'll see what that does. And there's a whole bunch of real long things, but phytase is a, is a um, um, our, uh, enzyme that helps make phosphorus in this feed more available to the animal itself. Therefore, we put less phosphorus period into, into the feed and reducing our, our carbon footprint. Two other things that we put in um, our feed that also reduces the amount of soybean meal. Soybean meal, I told you, has a lot of protein. Have you, I don't know if you've understood the relationship of protein 
and nitrogen uh, in, in some of your maybe science classes or bioscience classes. So, and that's something you can look up too, is uh, the relationship of nitrogen and protein. So in, in, in ruminants and cattle, sometimes they literally will feed urea uh, as a protein source to give the animals protein. And here, it's that soybean meal, that, that leftover part of that ranch dressing. So we, if, we, if we weren't using two amino acids, okay, one is um, L, uh, excuse me, I'll give you the first one, L-lysine, so L-Y-S-I-N-E, Google that too and understand how it, important it is, but it's an amino acid. I'm sure you've learned about different amino acids in school. Uh, and another one called L-threonine, and it's T-H-R-E-O-N-I-N-E, -E, I think. Another amino acid. So we add those two amino acids to this feed further because that's the next limiting factors in our, in our animal feed. So if we didn't add those, we'd have to add more of that soybean meal, that ranch dressing, what's left over from the ranch dressing. And then they just can't use all that. So then they, they would come out as a byproduct in the manure and it would make the manure higher in nitrogen. So by feeding, L-threonine and lysine, we use less protein and, and we, we do, we feed exactly what, and Tom's doing the same thing in his barn. He's feeding many different phases or, or different rations um, between every, I shouldn't say not between, but as the pigs get uh, in different ages uh, and sizes, and we're doing the same thing here primarily to two different, whether they're gestating, okay, or just maintaining themselves or lactating, produce milk to make these pigs uh, 12 pounds, 13 pounds in 21 days. And, and so environmentally, uh, people, and I kind of forget about it, and, I, and we've gotten a little bit more into detail, but I know this is an advanced placement uh, environmental science class, and, and I went into a lot more detail, and Jennifer knows that, but, but those are things that are in our feed that we sometimes don't think about, but really environmentally are there to um, you know, reduce our environmental impact. And then it also, you know, makes economic sense also to put those, um, the phytase and the lysine and the L-threonine into those feeds as well. So I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna let uh, them talk a little bit about probably their water consumption. I'm gonna move to, I'm gonna show you some pigs that are ready to be weaned uh, on Thursday. So I'm gonna find you some bigger pigs and just show you how big the pigs get from from this age uh, to, and, and she hasn't had any more pigs, unfortunately, uh, um, but I'm gonna move and show you some bigger pigs. So I'm gonna uh, shut my video off and I'll let you talk a little bit about water consumption. And maybe if there's some questions, raise your hands up and we'll be glad to answer them. Okay, so we have it right now and it's a little bit hard to see, but these are the water meters. These are all the these are all the valves of water going into the barn. So Tom is able to see the water pressure and then see the, the measurements of the water and record that each day. The other thing is, is that we were talking earlier about ventilation. So behind us, we're gonna turn over and these are the controllers. And what we do is, is piglets, when they first come in, we want them to be warmer. We want them, as I talked about those brooders, kind of a heat lamp on them. And so a lot of times we start the barns at about 84 degrees. And over time, we drop that down. And right now, the pigs, the size that they are, um, it's at 65, kind of a current set point. And we can just put in, uh, with these buttons, we'll put, and, and program the set point. And then over here, it tells, because of the different stages, there's different stages that tell how those inlets are gonna open up to allow more air to come in or close down. Um, these barns go into what's called a full tunnel and the curtain on the one end opens completely up and it draws air across those pigs and it gets down to about 65 degrees. The other nice thing too is, is in the heat of summer, in the heat of summer, we are able to put misters. So why would we want a mist on pigs versus damp, like complete drenching those pigs? Um, if anybody write that down, see if you guys have any ideas and we can come back to that. 
Uh, but one of the reasons is, is if you drench, if you think about it, if you get completely wet, it almost holds that heat in. So you want to lightly mist them. It is called evaporative cooling. So those pigs get a little bit misted and it allows that heat to come off of their bodies versus keeping it in. Um, so we're able to do that in the summertime through these different controllers and ventilation systems. We have emergency action plans. So if anything happens and this completely shuts down, there's a system that kicks in and it drops the curtains um, and that protects the pigs from having any injuries or anything like that if there's a power outage. Uh, so we have a lot of systems in place in these barns to really protect the pig and make sure that there's any power or extreme um, natural disaster type things uh, that the barn takes over and uh, we control that. We found a visitor in the barn. Somebody just came out of the shower. This is, so, so I'm Jennifer with Support Council. I don't think I've been on camera yet. This is Gracie. Hi, I'm Gracie. What are, what are you doing here, Gracie? We've got some high school students in Dublin. Did you know this was gonna be happening or did you just walk into a surprise? I walked into a surprise. I am doing the guilt selection. So I come in and I select guilts, which are your female pigs that have never had a litter of piglets and I select them to put them on a truck to ship them out all over the United States. Um, the pigs I'm selecting today are actually shipping to Illinois. When I select them, I look for multiple things, leg structure, make sure they don't have belly ruptures, which sometimes is when they're born, where their umbilical cord is. It sometimes can swell up, make sure that we don't ship anything like that, make sure that everything is intact and ready to ship. So it takes a team of people. There's a lot of people involved in a lot of the different steps. And just a little bit more about Gracie too. She is a registered veterinary technician and I have trained her. You can imagine with what I've uh, talked to you already about, we have about 150 different locations all over the state of Ohio. So there's no way that I can get to every barn all at all the time. And because of biosecurity, I can't. If there's a problem in one barn, I may have to be down a couple nights, which means I'm not allowed to go back into pigs maybe two nights. So I use, I use the weekend um, to be away from pigs. And then Mondays, I go into what's called our high health. Tom would be one of those barns. He's our high health. Uh, we have a lot of high health barns. And so Gracie will sometimes, and sometimes the growers as well, but she is able to do blood testing for me. So if there becomes an emergency, we have to get some type of testing done. Um, I rely on Gracie to do that as well. She's a registered vet tech, so helps me out greatly. Thanks, Gracie. You're welcome. <laughs> the other thing I don't know if we've mentioned is just the growth of the pig. So when the pig is first born, how long does it take from it to be born, what you're seeing happening at Jeff's barn, to market? Who can tell me? My finger, you tell them if I hold up your so how, who can tell me maybe um, how many, hold up fingers to guess about how much, how much do you think weight wise does the pig weigh when it goes to market? Any ideas? I'm going to need another hand. Let's show some fingers about maybe 100 pounds. How many, how many hundreds do you think they're? Over 400 pounds. Yeah, I see some fingers, good. I see some twos, threes. Okay, it's about 270 to 280 pounds is how much they weigh when they go to market. So now let's hold up, how old do you think those pigs are? They grow pretty quick, so how old do you think they are? Just when a pig is born, it weighs about, it weighs about two, three, three, four pounds. And then I said that it weighs about 280 when it goes to market. And that takes about six months. They're about six months of age when that happens. So those pigs grow really, really quickly. Um, so why do they grow that quick? They may be used to not. And that's why we've gone to a lot of these um, barns because if they're outdoors, they're fighting the weather. You guys don't, you guys don't like to be in the cold when it's you know negative two degrees out. Uh, neither do the pigs. So the ventilation, where we can control that in these barns, 
The other thing we can control, just like at Jeff, he can really control how much that sow is eating. So feed equals milk. I always communicate that to the people that work at the farms that if you get feed into that sow, she's gonna, she's gonna give a lot of milk. And that piglet, um, those piglets in a litter that, that Jeff's showing you, um, it's about 14 to 15 little babies running around. And so we are able to do that. The other thing is, is genetics. So Gracie's here to help select for uh, higher genetics. And she has a grid that she goes off of, it's called an index. And so the genetic company that we work with, they're always looking to improve. And some of that improvement is just feed efficiency, um, how much those pigs eat and how much they convert that to lean muscle. Uh, just like people, you know, if you're eating healthy and staying active, uh, you grow quickly and um, you're healthier. And I, want, I, I always remind groups that I'm talking to, you know, the pigs go from three pounds to these pigs are probably 13 pounds in three weeks, all on their mother's milk. Um, so just as Dr. Speck just mentioned, you know, you can see we feed these sows here. They're getting fed four different times a day by hand. So somebody is, is taking, here's our, um, our feed comes in through these uh, white tubes and down the red and uh, you can see the feed right there. She's probably, I think, without looking, she's been fed twice already today, and she's got plenty of feed in there. This sow will probably eat close to 36 pounds of feed a day. And you think about it, I don't know what you uh, have that has is, is 10 pounds. Um, maybe your book bag might weigh 15. Uh, she's eating uh, twice that weight and feed per day to make that much milk to raise her litter of pigs. And so she's very efficient and, and they have to be healthy to do that. And they have to be you know, feeling well. I, I was trying to show, I know Tom um, has cup waters. Well, we have a nipple before I showed a sow that was drinking. I'll try to get my, right at the end of my finger, there's a nipple. So the, our waters comes in a little different um, and she has a, a access to water and will drink at least three gallon of water a day. Um, as to, to make that much milk, sometimes more, depending on the temperature. And our barn too, just like Tom's, is environmentally controlled with different computer controllers. Um, you might have noticed that in the other barn, the heat lamp was really nice and warm. And again, environmentally, we have controllers that automatically sh turn this heat lamp. It's, it's probably, if I'll, I'm gonna turn the bulb up, it might, there might be a little power coming. Nope, it's completely off. So as it cools off in this barn a little bit at night, and these pigs are big, so we've got it set so that their temperature and they don't come on very quickly. Um, but so instead of burning that um, 100 plus watt, 125 watt heat bulb, it's turned off because the sow, the pigs are big enough and, and they don't need the extra warmth. So Again, it's on an automatic controller or it turns it off and on. There's a temperature probe that's at the pig level um, in one of the pens in here. And so that's what controls this. So um, very, very energy efficient. Um, the other thing I always tell, especially is our light bulbs. Tom has lots of lights. We have over 300 light bulbs. Uh, 10 years ago, we went to all the compact fluorescent uh, CFL spirals that we went from a 100 watt bulb to a 26 watt bulb. And now we're converting everything to LED. So we're going from a 20, um, a 26 watt bulb down to a eight. Some of our LEDs are eight watts and some are 10 watts. And uh, they're more expensive, but they last a long time. And our CFLs have lasted a long time too. But again, not as good for the environment, the CFLs. So we're now switching uh, the farm to LEDs. So uh, I see one across the room. It's going to be hard to hard to pick it out, but they look just like all the rest. I know that I can see one right over there. Uh, that and so again, yes. When, do you want to wrap up this thought while the class gets some questions ready? Yeah, and then and I'm going to go outside. We'll but go yeah. ahead, keep going with okay. with just wrap this thought up, and we'll go to the class. Well, yeah, and, and I'm looking for some questions. 
So uh, this kind of gives you an overview. There's 56 litters in here, and uh, and they're just on Thursday. They will be weaned, which is taken away from their mother. They're at an age that they'll start on feed that that little pellet that Dr. Speck mentioned earlier, and and go to a barn just like Tom. So uh, there's kind of an overview, and these these pigs are doing well, and we're uh, can't wait to move them on to their next phase, somebody like Tom. So with that, I'll wrap up. I'm gonna move outside and uh, I'm looking forward to asking any questions or it, trying to answer any questions. All right, let's hear from the students. What's on your mind? I don't know. We've got, we have a lot of, that we've never had this many experts available, this many farmers, a veterinarian, a vet tech. This has never happened on a virtual field trip before. The question was, do pigs ever bite each other? Fight or bite? I'm sorry. Bite. All right. How about bite. the veterinarian or Tom? I've got a little story about that. I've I've shot some video in my barn when when the baby pigs come in, and just mainly for that reason, just so that I've got some things on record. For and to back that, I I do some ag in the classroom things and take videos in with me. Uh, I've got a video of baby pigs fighting a hen, and I show that just because to let you know that, I mean, let the students that I usually talk to show how pigs interact. They're just like people. They, we can go show, show you that a little bit. Just, just, we'll take some time, we'll show the camera on some pigs and, and let you see. But they, they, they do just like people. There's peer pressure in a pig pen, and they, they mess with each other, and sometimes, one of them doesn't like it so much, so they do. They do bite each other. So just take some time and, and watch some of them interact with each other. They, if you're looking over in the second pen, they, they like to be close to each other. They're social, and they don't mind. You know, these, pen, these pigs have been in here since, well, like I said, they've been in here over two months. So they've got their pecking order established, and they're comfortable with each other. But, you know, just like humans, they'll tick each other off every once in a while, and and might nip or something like that. You want to speak yeah, to that? You want to talk about why they're marked pain? If you notice, if you notice on down farther into the third pen here in front of us, you can see some now that that have pink marks on them. And uh, Gracie has been in those pens and marked marked these pigs. We're actually shipping a load of gilts out to Illinois in the morning. So she's come in and put those marks on to let me know which ones that she thinks are better and we'll go on that truck. Does anybody have any other questions? All right, so Mark, you guys said you had a thousand like beef eggs a week. I was wondering like, how many of those like die per week? Like, has it been increased? Can somebody repeat the question, or maybe? Uh, I'll just speak really loud. All right. So, uh, you said you had a thousand new pigs a week, and my question was, how many of those die per week, and has that number number been increasing or decreasing throughout the year? Okay. Very good question. Um, so yeah, for every, so we average about uh, 13 pigs born alive per litter. And um, there will be some that'll be born that, um, some are first of all born, born dead, we call them a stillborn. Um, but some are, are small and, and weak that, um, you know, might struggle. Uh, unfortunately, if you think about the size of that pig, um, three, three pounds and her mom, their mom weighs about 450 pounds. Um, our biggest loss is if a sow will lay on a baby pig. So we do have 
uh, the biggest percentage of a pig's uh, of losses in a pig's barn, unless they're sick, um, are nor is normally um, in a farrowing farm like ours. So we'll lose um, between 10 and 15 percent of those thousand pigs um, per per week, and then um, and then those are those are composted at the farm and returned back to the farm fields over time. Um, they compost anything that dies, we have to compost again for biosecurity reasons. We don't want anybody picking them up. So it really works very, very well on our farm. And as far as increasing or decreasing, we always want that number to be going down. If we have a health challenge is when that number will go up. So that's a, a very, very good question. Another question. Hey, what's the biggest pig you've ever seen? The biggest pig I've never, I've ever seen? Well, I'll, I don't go to those fairs and look at the big animals in a, in a tent or anything like that, but uh, I don't know. The biggest one we've had's probably been over 600 pounds and, and it's probably been a male animal and, we, and we've had some some females that would get that size occasionally but most of them average 450 to 500 pounds next question and if you would like to direct the question at a specific person please let us know that as well I think we may have frozen up a bit here. Okay, yeah, I'm, I, am I good or not, Emily? You're good, You're good. The, the class, oh, there's, can, the, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Okay, we're back. <laughs> All right, let's take another question from the class. And if you have a specific person to direct the question to, please let us know. Otherwise, feel free to ask general questions. Go ahead, the question was, what is your main source for water? Where do you get it? I'll, I'll answer that first. Um, we have a well. We have actually two wells. One uh, that's that, two different wells. One, the one that uh, serves my house, that's where I live. And then another one specifically for this complex back here that you see. And they are hooked together in case for some reason a pump would go out or something, that's our backup. So uh, our wells are about 60 feet deep. And, um, and uh, just, uh, I don't know if, uh, if, if you talk about well water, but you can go on Ohio Department of Natural Resources website and uh, you can Google, if you know somebody that has a well, you can put in their name or address and you can see how deep that is and how, uh, how much clay and sand and silt and how much water it pumps per minute. You could go on and find mine as well. So that's all, uh, that's a very good question. And you can look that up as well and, and, and kind of understand more about what's underneath where we're walking. But all of our water comes from the well. Tom? Yeah, our barn, our barn is, is well water as well. And we've got the one barn, it's a 2,400 head barn is what the total capacity of that barn is. We've got two wells as well. And we can switch back and forth or run them together. Uh, I was going to go a little bit into consumption. Uh, in the heat of the summer, 2,400 head barn can use up to 6,000 gallon of water a day. So we make sure that we do have ample ample uh, water supply and our wells are good. Our wells in this area are typically 80 to 100 feet, but we've never had a well go dry. We've had pump failures, so we keep an extra pump on the shelf and, and you know, we're ready to tackle that problem when it when it comes up. But it's all well water. Main, main, most farms are on, on well water. And, I have and a question I'll... for the class, maybe. Does anybody, um, does anybody know the difference between Western Ohio, kind of the topography versus Eastern part of Ohio? Anybody traveled a little bit back and forth between 
um, the two sides of the state and have any ideas uh, what the difference might be and maybe Tom and if we have time if Tom and Jeff can speak maybe a little bit different of how they manage some of their uh, environmental things. Any ideas from the class? If you go to Western Ohio, how's the land lay over there versus over in Eastern Ohio? Somebody has a guess, I'm sure. Eastern is hillier. Eastern is hillier. Yep. And Western, where I'm at, pretty flat, isn't it? And, and, and today it's really windy. You can see the flag blowing there. It's really, it's pretty breezy. Hopefully that doesn't bother um, the microphone, but um, I'm gonna touch base real quick um, on some environmental and, and what we do with the, the manure that's produced in our barns from the animals. So we've talked a little bit about that. Tom mentioned it as well. So, um, and we have a pit under this barn. That's the gestation barn. The barn we just come out of is the farrowing barn where I'm pointing to. That has a shallow pit or just about two foot of a collection area underneath the animals. That helps so we keep our, uh, keep a, a very good healthy air uh, environment for those small animals. And then we also have, there's pit fans. It's kind of hard to see, but those, those uh, little round circles there, um, those are, those run 24 seven, never shut off. So that's drawing just any general gas off the pit and it keeps a very, very good environment inside the barn. Um, so once a year, we're, we apply the manure from those barns onto fields like this. So I wanted to, uh, since this was an environmental class, I wanted to come out into this field. Um, this was wheat, so it was winter wheat, it was planted about a year ago. We harvested the wheat in July, around the 4th of July, you might see those fields turn golden brown. We harvested the wheat, the wheat then goes to a, a milling company down by Cincinnati for mostly crackers, not so much bread, uh, but mostly crackers and cookies is what our wheat is used for. Then we applied manure onto this. This is a 126 acre field. We applied manure with a, what's called a drag line injection system. Um, so the manure is pumped through a, a hose and we pull that hose behind the applicator and we're putting the manure right on top of the ground. And, and as you can see, and you can't maybe tell, but this, this tree line, that's a creek. So we have a creek that starts right at our farm. So we don't want anything to get into that creek. Um, we wanna keep everything on the farm. So we've applied the manure in this, normally in July, it rained all July. So we actually applied it in August. And then we planted this cover crop. So you might, Maybe or maybe you've not heard about cover crops, but cover crops help hold nutrients in place. So we planted oats. So this is an oats cover crop. And you can see the soil down in here, how it holds the soil. It's using up, the oats is nice and green. So I talked about some of the nitrogen that comes from the manure and how we feed those amino acids to keep our nitrogen levels as low as possible, but still meet all the requirements of the animal. So that manure has been applied out here and then we've reseeded this. I took uh, our time and effort and, and bought seed, put this oats on and now it is using up the nutrients and will turn into basically a green manure. So then as this dies, uh, it won't die at the first frost. This will live till usually mid-December. So oats isn't, isn't killed off with the first frost. I know we, we, it got pretty cold the other day and it's gonna get cold again this weekend this will remain green at least for another month, if not six more weeks. So that will continue to use up those nutrients and keep them here on the farm. So it's a very important aspect of what we do. We also, I mentioned the creek, we also have filter strips. So we don't farm or apply any manure close to the creek. And you can see the line right here. Here's the field edge over here. Here's our filter strip. So this is been here for about 16 years now. Um, this is a, a grass filter strip. It goes all the way to the back of the farm and it's also on the other side of the creek as well. So we feel filter strips are very, very important to protect the environment and protect the creek. This water eventually all flows um, south 
to the Miami River through Dayton, Ohio, and eventually to the Ohio River. So um, it all starts, you know, on our little watershed here. Uh, we want to protect it and keep it, um, keep the nutrients here and, and protect it for all those using the water downstream. And I'm going to jump in at that point too because our farm uses filter strips as well. We've got, uh, it's called a creek, it's the Wakatomica Creek. It's actually, if you were to look at it, it would be a small river that cuts through uh, most of our fields. Our fields aren't as big as Jeff. The biggest one we have is only eight, is, well, only 80 acres. That's big in some terms, but we, uh, we use our manure from our hog barn as our fertilizer as well. Uh, we do buy some extra nitrogen and apply in the spring, but as far as the commercial fertilizers, we only buy some extra nitrogen to help boost our manure nitrogen. Uh, we do some other things that Jeff might do. He didn't speak about it, but we apply microbes into our pit and that helps keep those solids digested in the barn. It helps, it helps the odor some, somewhat, but it, the main thing is it improves the uh, fertilizer value of the nutrients in the manure and applying those to the fields. Uh, we also have a, a study going on right now with our uh, county soil and water district where we're testing water. Our, most of our fields have tile in them to take excess water out. And that water flows into the streams out of those fields. So we're doing some uh, water monitoring and testing those, th that water for, for nutrient runoff. And we found since we've started using microbes in our, in our manure and applying to those fields that we're actually retaining more nutrients in our, in our fields than we were before. So just some other things uh, conservation wise that we're doing to help improve water quality. And in turn, it helps our bottom line. So farmers are always doing, looking for different ways to do things more efficiently and to protect the environment. And Great. Yeah. So what, what questions? Let's go to the class and see what they're interested in learning and talking a little bit more about right now. And then Jeff, I don't think we've seen you on camera yet. So the next time you answer a question, uh -huh. you might just show your face. Just one time. One time. <laughs> Was there a question in the class that we couldn't hear? Um, what are you, how do you deal with um, parasites and different in the crops? And like with like management? Can, can, can that? Just repeat it if you could, Donna. Miss, Mrs. Parker, Miss Parker, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, how do you deal with um, parasites and different um, bacteria and issues with your crops? And um, how do you prevent that from occurring? Did she say with the crops or with the pigs? Crops. With the crops. Okay, very good. So, you know, as far as Paras not really parasites. We have parasites with the, with, with, that we don't want on our animals, but we have um, um, primarily bugs or insects is what I would refer to. So, you know, we're lucky that w in Western Ohio and, and really in the Eastern part of the Corn Belt, that we don't deal with a lot of um, terrible bugs, especially in corn and soybeans. You know, we watch for them, we scout for them. That's called integrated pest management. So we're looking at our IPM, you can Google that as well. Um, we work with our ex county extension agent through Ohio State. And if there's um, you know, bug issues, you know, probably the biggest thing would be disease. Uh, in wheat, this crop that was before the oats crop, we have uh, what's called head scab. So it can infect the, the wheat uh, real right before harvest. So we're, we do spray a fungicide for that. Um, and then, um, you know, primarily everything else would be, um, you know, through the genetics of the crops um, would protect what needs to be protected. And occasionally, if we have an insect uh, issue, we'll put an insecticide with it as well. So um, um, those are the main things. You know, the biggest thing is weeds. Um, this, this, this field here has some weeds in it, um, but it's a cover crop, so it's not a, a major concern. Uh, we don't want weeds because it robs our valuable nutrients and uh, and moisture, which is our most limiting factor uh, when we raise a crop is normally too much moisture or not enough.
but a great question. What other questions are there? All right, so my question is, uh, what are some things on the farm you guys could uh, improve on to make it more environmental friendly? That's a great question. Tom, do you want to start? Well, the biggest thing we've done in the past is, like I mentioned, using the uh, using microbes on our manure. Yeah, we it, we've seen we've seen a lot of results as far as improving uh, improving uh, our our flowability and and mainly our bottom line. The thing that it does uh, a, an issue that a lot of farmers deal with, especially in livestock production, is uh, the in the pits where the manure is stored. Sometimes your solids like with undigested feed, the feed we mentioned from, from the feeders being wasted, that can just go to the bottom and, and sit there and build up a sludge over time, which is very hard to get out. And that's what we've learned by using, by using this, uh, this, micro, this microbe addition to it. It keeps that pit, the anaerobic action uh, active in that pit. And we don't have a sludge problem in the bottom of our pit. Our pit has, uh, when, a, when an animal, when a livestock barn is, uh, when the manure is taken out, it's typically you have a pump that, that you bring in and it sets. Why don't, why don't we go to the barn and show the pit? Yeah, okay, we haven't looked in the pit yet. We can go, we can go show you. I've got a, uh, a stick here that I keep right by the door to measure the, the, the fluid level in my pit. My pit is, uh, it's six feet deep, below the pigs. And I usually use this to, to measure what the depth is. It's about 48 inches right now. But pushing that stick into the pit, I felt no resistance as I go in. And I'm holding a speaker in my hand so I can't talk. But even on the bottom, I come in sometimes and poke it around and feel the bottom. I don't feel any, any sludge in the bottom of that pit. And so that tells me that uh, that tells me that my pit is active as far as as being I, I say bugs bugs are digesting and, and working working in that manure to keep those nutrients equalized throughout that because we do we, we test our manure it's a it's a resource to us so we put a dollar value to that so anything we can do to improve that that bottom line and reduce costs as far as commercial fertilizers we do and Jen, Jennifer, uh, to answer that question, um, again, Tom and I, we've never met until about 10 minutes before this video started. We too do very some of the similar things here in Western Ohio. We do add stuff to our pit. We also add some things to our manure to make, um, to hold the nutrients in place. And um, we too also worked with some um, water quality testing connected to Ohio State a few years ago. As I mentioned, this creek starts right here on our farm, right back behind me here. So we could real easily capture, and we farm about all this uh, ground in this watershed. So we could easily capture the data, and we measured what was coming out of our tiles as well here at the creek. And we knew that some of that phosphorus and nitrogen was leaving. And that's one of the reasons we implemented the cover crops here um, that you see. So, you know, we're always looking for ways to improve our farm environmentally. Um, we've tried to do as many of those as possible that, that makes economic and environmental sense. Um, we also soil sample, all, everything is applied. We, we haven't talked about the, through uh, GPS or glo global positioning systems. We variable rate um, our nitrogen. So if we have an area that needs less, we put less on. If we have an area that didn't get as much manure um, for some reason, we can apply more nitrogen if it needs it. We also soil test when the corn, so next year, this will be corn, uh, this will be a corn crop. We'll actually soil test in early June to see how much nitrogen is available as those soil microbes uh, warm, uh, warm, as the soil warms up and the microbes start to digest the manure even further. We look at how much nitrogen is there and only apply what we need. So we're, we're using lots of systems. Uh, the iPad that I'm holding, um, yes, last night as we were shelling corn, it's collecting yield data. So we're utilizing yield data through our iPads 
um, and then making decisions from that environmentally as well. So we, we use a whole host of things from uh, growing a, a cover crop to using uh, GPS and rate controllers to put different amounts of fertilizer or no fertilizer on um, at different times uh, when the crops need it, especially corn. So I've gotten to work, this is Jennifer, and I've gotten to work at the Port Council for about 13 years, and it's been really neat to see how farmers are continually investing in more technology and trying new things and and just just continually trying to do better. And that's what you see in families like Jeff, like Tom's, um, like families all, all over the state. So I'll, okay. Are there other questions? Or Jeff, did I cut you off? Nope. I'm worried about my dog. He's running away down the filter strip. <laughs> He's way right. down there. Let's take the next question then. So you said that like all of the pigs on the farm in East Ohio are females and then they're sold from the other farm. Like. What do you do with the male pigs? The male pigs are they're split when they're when they're weaned. Weaning is when when the the baby pigs are are taken off of the mothers. Uh, my barn only receives female pigs. The male pigs go to another barn somewhere else and are raised. For and males only go uh, into the into the to the food chain, you know, for human food where the females could be going back for breeding purposes or for, or for meat. So that's, that's a unique situation um, here because we work with a genetic company and that's not across the industry. Um, across the industry, and, and Jeff can talk about that, for the most part, they're mixed. You have both males. Um, a male, a boar is castrated um, and it's called a barrow. And so across the industry, those two are actually mixed in most barns and then sold for um, food and safe food consumption. But we have a unique situation where we raise replacement genetic stock, and that's why it's a little bit unique that Tom just has gilts in his barn. Um, there's a lot of times, like he said, that we split them out, uh, but that's just a unique situation here because we work with a genetic company so closely. Um, and the other thing that we got to look at is, is just the density. So density by that, I mean, in Western Ohio, um, if you look, Jeff is surrounded by a lot of different hog farms, um, where in Eastern Ohio, there's not as many hog farms over in Eastern Ohio. And so that's why we get away with, um, I shouldn't say get away, but we, we have less pressure germ pressure, bug viruses, bacteria pressure over in Eastern Ohio. Plus we have some hills that break up the wind and tree lines. And so unfortunately some of that, just like in people, it spreads through the air. So we gotta be really cautious of that. So that's why um, the company I work for, we have that unique uh, situation where we can re raise replacement guilt. And we, that's why we have to shower. Jeff um, has some different protocols that he follows for biosecurity too. Uh, but my record, if anybody wants to guess, my record for showers is 13 in one day. Gracie might have me beat, but I'd say it's probably similar. What's your record? 15. That's just because I showered when I got home. <laughs> Um, and so that way, when we're going back and forth between these barns, we have a shower. Uh, that means we literally take our street clothes off and we're going to show you the shower. We cannot, we cannot come into this barn before we go to the shower. There's no option. So we come into the other side, the other side of the shower, and our street clothes are all over there. Uh, we get undressed. We shower, this is kind of called what's a, a clean, dirty line. So over there, we consider that dirty. Um, we don't want to drag any dirt, any type of, the other thing that's really critical is weed and rodent control. We didn't get into that much, um, but we want to make sure that all that and all of our growers go through what's called a pork quality assurance program, just like Jeff and all the growers that he works with. We go through a pork quality assurance and I actually brought the book today it's a pretty long manual and after we go through this and all the growers are certified they they take a test 
Uh, so we take this stuff very seriously. It talks about even the environment things that we went through. Uh, it talks about animal handling and it talks about air quality. So I always tell people feed, water, and air. Just like people, feed, food, water, and air is what anything needs to survive. So we do the shower in, shower out to prevent anything from coming in with us. We have the washer and dryer set up right here on the farm. So no clothing needs to leave. Um, so we take this really seriously. The other thing is, is I was talking earlier about some, some viruses going back and forth right now in people. Um, you hear a lot about flu and flu shots, getting your flu shots. Um, we recommend if any growers are feeling sick and they have a temperature that they don't go in with the pigs because they can carry that in and get, get the pigs sick. So we don't want that to happen. Unfortunately, some of our growers um, may not have extra help. And so they might be able to call somebody that's been around. For the most part, they do because they have to load the pigs. And in order to load and unload pigs, it takes, you know, two, three, usually three or four people. Um, but in any instance, we also have protective human medicine or human products that we can use. So I'll just take that off, but I'll wear a mask and that way it prevents anything respiratory wise um, from going back and forth. And if there's allergies, if people have some allergies or things like that, um, we always have masks available for people to use in the barn. Does it make sense when we use the word grower? Does anybody know what that means? Farmer right. and grower are kind of intertwined or used used uh, intermittently in our in our uh, I guess in the world that we talk. So for the students, uh, Tom might be called a grower. I might be called a grower, um, or I like to be called a farmer. <laughs> So Tom, you're self-employed. You want to just say, like, give a minute overview on what, how you work with another farm? Yeah, I am. I'm self-employed. Our farm is actually set up as a partnership with my brother and my parents. My wife is a school teacher in Zanesville. Uh, I have, I didn't even mention my family earlier. I have three children. They're all grown. Uh, they, my boys went off and got good jobs. They still come back to the farm and help. And I say good job because they make a lot more money than we do in farming. Farming isn't really about the money. Farming's hard to get into because of the cost that, that things are. We do it. It's a lifestyle. We do it because we love it. We, it's, it is stressful. And uh, we, we live a lot on, on faith that things, things are going to work out for us. It's just, it's just, there's no other way to say it. It's just a different lifestyle. And, and the ones who do it, do it because they love it. Sometimes, you know, like I say, it's stressful and we, we learn how to deal with that. But uh, we, do, we do crops, we do livestock, we've got 60 beef cows. So I do not, I do not own these pigs. Uh, back when we decided to do this, this barn has been up for 13 years. I've been raising pigs this way for 13 years. I have done what Jeff does uh, when, we, when we first first came here, we, we were a farrow finish operation with only 150 sows, and there still are a few farmers in Ohio with, with those kind of numbers. He's okay, he's farrow, I guess Jeff is farrow to wean. So, but it's just, it's just a different thing. There's many different kinds of farmers out there. There's farmers who don't have livestock at all. There's farmers who only do, only raise pigs. There's Right. Are you hearing what Jennifer? Jennifer's reminding me that that uh, I do this. I do this on a contract basis, and I put the barn up and I raise pigs for another farm who has many farms and many employees. So there's probably close to a hundred people that have barns that raise like I do just in this system alone. I kind of forget about that sometimes because being in Eastern Ohio, I'm, I'm kind of isolated. I can't, there's probably, there's a barn that's six miles from me. There's another barn that's eight miles away from me. Uh, that probably speaks a little bit to why I have considered a high herd health because we don't have that other livestock pressure, namely pigs around us. 
So, so in contrast, what Tom just told you, the closest pig barn is six miles. Um, I've went on Google Earth and literally counted in a five mile radius. So that's 10 miles uh, across, but five miles from my farm, if I count about every pig barn, there are 70,000 pigs within five miles of my farm. So that gives you an idea of the different type of terrain and, and, um, and uh, the amount of pressure. So the wind's blowing today. It's a, it's a day that we're you know, always concerned about bringing a, a wind bringing in a different disease uh, or virus to our farm. And uh, uh, I know uh, I also wanted to mention, uh, I'll let Dr. Speck, she looks like she wants to uh, mention something real quick and then I'll gather my thoughts, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to make one real quick comment, but before, um, let's think of some more questions and we'll take those. But if farmers working with farmers, so Tom is working with a, a farm and they supply the pigs, but we're all in this together. We're in this together with Jeff too. We have a, a networking system where if there's any con, um, concerns. We have a communication, just like we're doing here. Communication so easy nowadays with technology. Um, so we're always helping each other out. And if there's something that happens, um, you know, we watch out for each other and we make sure that we try not to spread anything um, that we don't want to. So farmers helping farmers, really. So what questions do you have? Uh, and, and my thought was too, is employees. So I didn't mention, but we have uh, four full-time employees, all people, local people from here in town um, that some of them, are, most all of them are raised on farms and they enjoy working with animals. So um uh, our employees are vital, and then you know we mentioned. I mentioned my my um, my children. I have a junior and an eighth grader. Um, I was busy Sunday afternoon and Saturday afternoon in the fields, and my children can do all the evening feeding, um, feed all the sows, take care of all the baby pigs, um, and it's a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful way to raise a family. So, just as Tom says, uh, the money, it's, it's sometimes it can be a very negative. Uh, aspect is you're losing money but uh, it's a great way to raise a family and it's where this is the farm that I was raised on and and uh, thoroughly thoroughly proud of it so class what questions do you have um, this is sort of a joint question um, how uh, do you allow sows to reproduce more than once and how long do the sows live after they give birth? I mean, after they... So, so um, uh, uh, we get gilts, we buy gilts from Was farms. For Terry? Anybody. I'm sorry. No, go ahead, Jeff. It was for anybody. Yeah, so, so um, we buy pigs uh, just like uh, from a farm, just like Tom's. Um, they come to our farm and they are, they are bred or artificially inseminated at about eight months of age. Um, they'll have their first pigs at about one year of age. And then we like the, we hope that the, 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 the animal or the sow will stay, you know, we'll have, we call parodies. So every time they have pigs is a parody. Um, so we'll ha we have some sows that have had uh, over 10 litters, um, not very many, um, you know, but we, we want to keep them here at least um, you know, four to four years of age, that's where we get back the most. Um, we have to pay a genetic premium for those animals. So we want to at least have, you know, six to seven litters where they're close to four years of age. Um, and uh, unfortunately, not all of them do that. Our average is um, about that. But so if an animal has, for some reason, consistently doesn't have very many pigs, there might be a reason for that that we don't know. You know, she is called then and she's taken to market. So um, she's, she's normally the, uh, a sausage type of a, an animal. Bob Evans or Johnsonville or that type of a, a company will buy them and make a, make a sausage out of them. Any other, any other questions? I can, I can talk a little bit about veterinary school. I know your teacher had mentioned that you had some questions about uh, the difference between vets and how long 
uh, small animal versus maybe large animal vet. I have the experience of, of doing both, and I'm really happy and glad that I had that experience. For vet school, it does take about eight years. So you have about, you have four years, sometimes three, depending on your advancement and acceptance into veterinary school. But average, it's four years of undergrad work where you have to get all the prereqs, um, a lot of sciences, uh, science, math, organic chemistry, biochemistry. Uh, so hopefully you like those types of, of classes. And then from there, veterinary school, you can apply uh, I went to Ohio State for, for all my eight years, but you can apply to some other veterinary schools. Um, Purdue has one. Um, over surrounding states, they have vet schools. One thing you have to look at is cost. Cost of those vet schools, a lot of times you have out-of-state tuition, and it's pretty expensive. Um, so those are some things to keep in mind. But grades, experiences, uh, so working or shadowing at vet, vet clinics and getting to know what you enjoy, whether that be surgery, medicine, you have all types of options, just like in people. Um, there's oncology, there's soft tissue surgery anymore. Um, they are doing hip replacements on dogs. So you have a lot of options in vet school of what path you wanna go down. I took the path of doing mixed animal. I did grow up in, in, in uh, an area where we had a practice. I worked there in high school and then shadowed all through vet school and undergrad. I got hired by them and did a lot of small animal and dairy work. Um, things you keep in mind is just physical. Uh, large animal can be pretty physical and, late and intensive. Just with palpation, you do a lot of pregnancy checks to make sure that the cows, the dairy cattle are pregnant. Um, and then how I got onto the path a little bit of swine is, is my parents built a barn, just like we're standing in right now, of Tom, and the veterinarian um, is over in Western Ohio, but he was, you know, getting behind and needed a lot of extra help and offered me a position, and I moved over to Western Ohio, and, and as, as you already heard, Jeff mentioned, there's a lot of pigs over there, so uh, I learned a lot about pigs in a short period of time. And I really enjoy this type of work. I get to work with Tom. I get to work with, a, you know, as he already mentioned, 100 or plus different, different farmers. And that's just enjoyable to me because I was able to grow up in that lifestyle and really, really want to help the farmers and also want to put a, a safe, wholesome food product on your table. And that's how I got into kind of pig medicine. But there's a lot of opportunities uh, career path-wise. Great. I know we've got some exciting answers to questions, but let's hear some more questions from you, from the students. Uh, what's the most common like disease that you find in the Most common. Can you? I I didn't hear it. Sorry, Jennifer. Uh, what's the most common disease that you would find in the pigs, or like parasites or whatever? Okay, Dr. Speck, you want me to take that? You can, it varies because uh, unfortunately Jeff has a lot more pressure so he can speak and, <laughs> and I'll add. You know, I, uh, the worst, you know, some people ask what's the worst part of my job. The worst part of my job is, is when our animals are sick. And Dr. Speck knows that um, because of where I'm at, I'm faced with lots of challenges, but um, the biggest challenge that we face and you can Google this, it's, uh, the initials are P-R-R-S, PERS. It stands for porcine, which is pig, respiratory and reproductive syndrome. And, and they will, uh, that is my biggest challenge. Uh, we vaccinate for it, but there are so many different variances or strains of it that we may have one strain or type of vaccine in the herd and a new one, somebody might bring pigs from another state, maybe North Carolina, or Illinois or Iowa, and it might be five miles from me and that strain could affect my pigs. So um, PERS is my biggest concern. Probably then the next one might be flu, um, just as was mentioned earlier before. Yeah, I would agree. I would agree with what Jeff um, has mentioned and 
also to kind of go along with that is is in in western ohio it's very farm oriented uh the flat lands there's a lot of crop production out there and so there's you know jobs it's family farming um where in eastern ohio you get into we're not where tom's at right now we're not very far from columbus um some of the bigger cities and so sometimes we get pressure from that and uh as tom mentioned even jeff uh Crop land, just land in general is very expensive. And so these guys really, farmers take pride in their land and, and they know how to um, nourish that land, take care of that land, and it's come up through generations. And so they're very adamant about hanging on to that and making sure that they're doing a good job. Just like anything, if they don't take care of the land, they don't take care of the pigs, it, it costs them. And, and so they are very um, sure that they're doing what's best for everything. What other questions do you have? There's one thing I did wanna mention. I am involved with Farm Bureau and all these farming org organizations work together, but Farm Bureau has a demonstration farm. It's called Blanchard Watershed. So Blanchard Watershed, and maybe you looked that up already in your, um, in your class, but there is a website and it's just, if you Google that, it'll come up. And they have a lot of different conservation practices, um, edge of the field where they're, they're watching the water runoff and measuring what is actually coming off those fields. Um, so I would, that's a really good project to look into. And we'll take one last question. I'm unable to hear that. Can you repeat it? Yeah, if we can speak right up into it, then we can hear a lot better. Thank you. What health measures do you take to keep the pigs healthy and not get them infected? Do you do vaccines or Yeah, so Tom and Jeff both work really closely and the farm that I'm employed by work really closely. Uh, these pigs get visits more than you go to the doctor. Uh, I'm in this barn yep. at least every 30 days, if not every two weeks and make sure. And so what I'm then able to do is, is know how those pigs are acting, know what's gonna be best. And I put together what's called vaccination protocols. So not every farm's the same. I'm not gonna use the same vaccines where Tom's pigs are coming from that I would use at Jeff's because of some of the pressure we've already talked about. And so we tailor those vaccination programs for that individual farm and really look at vaccinations, look at working with those people. Training is key for my job. I train these um, individuals to take care of the pigs. And like I talked about earlier, getting that pig off to, to the good start from the get go. When that pig popped out, um, was born, you saw how Jeff got it, um, dried it off. It's just like you coming out of, uh, you know, in, in a swimming pool, you guys all like to swim and you come out and there's a little bit of breeze, but it's 90 degrees out, you still feel that chill. So it's really critical we get those little baby pigs dried off, get them up so they can get that first milk, colostrum, and then Tom does the same thing when they first get here. So we really do a lot of training. Um, and if a pig does get sick, just like a person, um, it's inevitable, they're going to get sick. Just like you, you know, Tom will communicate, I'll communicate with Jeff, um, his veterinarian communicates, and we just say, hey, what's going on? And we may have to use an antibiotic, and that way it gets that pig better right away. And those antibiotics have what's called a withdrawal time. So it's out of their system. There, there's never any you know, you, you go to a meat case and you might see an antibiotic free versus nothing's labeled. It's, it's labeling. Um, no meat at your stores contains antibiotics. There's, there's stringent um, protocols at the plants that ensure that there's no antibiotic residue, anything like that in your meat. And we take pride in, in a wholesome food products. Real, real quick, Terry, be, before we switch from you, what about hormones? Are there hormones in the pork? 
so naturally, all just fruits and vegetables, um, any food products, and you, and you can look that up. There's some statistics out there, and maybe Jennifer can supply that, but I know there's some statistics out there that say how much hormones just naturally in, in, in food. However, there's never any antibiotics, or I'm sorry, never any hormones ever prescribed. It's illegal to use any type of hormones in food production. So no, there's never any added hormones. The thing that I want to speak back to is, is we, uh, we take a lot of measures to keep disease pressure out of our barns. I always go back to, to our, uh, to, she showed you the showers and we, we have a clean dirty line there. The shower is that clean dirty line. We are very protective of that line and we don't let, visitors don't come in these barns. The only people that come in here are people that come in to work and they, and they shower in and it's all about protecting the pigs so that we don't have to give antibiotics. Uh, another measure we do is, is the clothes. Outside clothes don't come in. We don't take cell phones in our barns. Nothing from the outside of the barn goes in where the animals are. Uh, even, even when we're moving animals on a truck, when that truck backs up to our dock, that driver does not come in our barn. He doesn't step on our chute. We don't step on his trailer. We, we take every practice we can to keep our herd health high. Tom made us put on unitards, <laughs> coveralls, <laughs> unitards. They, they're supplied. You don't bring anything of your own across that line, not through the shower. Jennifer, as, as, we, as we sum up, real quickly, I'd like, uh, I know the, the, the group uh, is, I want you, you got, to Google. You got two minutes. You want to close yeah. this out, Jeff? Well, I want them to Google uh, pork checkoff 50 year sustainability study. There's a great little poster that shows how we've progressed. And, and as I, Jennifer knows I often, uh, back here in this field where this barn sets in, we used to raise pigs outside at the very back. As I was a kid, we brought sows and littered up a lane right where this barn sets. And that's how we raised them. And I'm 46 years old. And in the last 50 years, our industry has changed from raising them outside to raising them in an environmentally controlled barn where we're, we're raising over 11 pigs per litter. Years ago, 50 years ago, we raised six, seven, eight pigs per litter. And it took us almost a year to get them to market. So there's a great poster. It talks about how much less water we use how much more energy, less energy we use, how we raise the crops, and how things have changed. So there's all types of facts, I'm sure, um, that your teacher would love to pull off of and put on their next quiz. So uh, Google that, there's, it really sums up of where we went in our industry. So um, we're out here every day trying to raise the most healthiest, nutritious pork, that, that pork loin, that sausage, that bacon, everybody loves bacon, uh, so that you can enjoy it and it's healthy for you and your, your family. So um, that's what we love to do and we're gonna keep doing it as long as we can. Any other final comments? One other homework project would be TAD. Look up TAD, T-A-D-D, -D. T -A -D -D. And it's a biosecurity measure for trailers, transportation of pigs. See what you can come up with, what that stands for. Thank you guys all for your time. Thanks to the farmers. We know you have a lot of other things you could be doing right now. Thank you to Dr. Terry. Thank you to Gracie. We appreciate everybody joining in. And we wish you students the, that you have a great day. Goodbye. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Bye.